Welcome to Truth to Power, a.k.a. Let's Talk with Hart Hagen. Today I'm joined by Jake Bush and Rolf Fries. Rolf and Jake, how are y'all doing today? Doing great. I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, I've got a cat with me on my desk here, What's brightening the mood. What's the cat's name? This is Remus. He Remus. is begging for food right now, as you can tell. Does he have a brother named Romulus? He actually does. <laughs> yeah, I was just ready to ask that same question. Yeah, does Romulus <laughs> live with y'all? Yes, yes, he is the shy one. That's awesome that y'all have Romulus and Remus. I have two pet rats that named Stevie and Ray, oh, uh, that, named after uh, Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles. And uh, so anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about local issues today, like local Louisville issues. And so what, what, what are we thinking on that? I mean, here, here's one thing I'm thinking about that. And that is that if you're at the national level, you're a little fish in a big pond. At the, it's hard to start at the national level and to think that you have any leverage over anything because they're, the people at the national, the, the structure, the power structures at the national level are so uh, powerful. They're so manipulative. They just have, they, they're out, we're outgunned on resources. But at the local level, we have a fighting chance to be a big fish in a little pond. Not us alone, but us in conjunction with other people. So uh, any, anyway, that's a, a rationale for focusing on the local. Um, but Jake, you had a, a source within local government, am I? revealing too much information there. Talk about your source and what he has to say and go from there. Yeah, so I, I have a very close friend who works in uh, economic development here in Louisville. And um, I don't think that's saying too much. Um, but, you know, basically what I wanted to ask him, because I know, you know, I know him very well. He's a very, very close friend of mine, has been for, for a long time. Um, and I know his values and I know that he's the kind of person who, you know, like us, believes in worker power and believes in, you know, the citizens not being left out of the decision-making process. You've got a very strong uh, democratic sentiment, I guess is how I would put it. Um, and I wanted to ask him, basically, because I know his values, I was asking, what the heck is going on with local government, not just in Louisville, but maybe specifically with Louisville, like what the heck's going on with this, uh, with all this, this money going to outside development, right? Like what's going on with this sort of paradigm uh, where we basically give up revenue streams in order to attract uh, business, you know? And, um, you know, I could get into some of what he's- two, two questions there. One is what's the rationale? Right. Or what's the theory? And then the other question is what's the outcome? What really happens? Yeah, and that's that's. Thank you for clarifying that because it's just it was a really expansive conversation. Um, and basically, what he was getting at was that there is actually uh, in local government a pretty strong desire to build up workforce capacity. He said that's one of the major things is basically saying here in Louisville we need uh, people who can enter the job market and actually compete. Because uh, so much of the job market is focused on sort of the national or international job market, you know, like what well, since globalization, basically, we're all competing across the world. You know, it's not like we're competing with other pe workers in our own towns anymore. That's what we're told. Well, that's what we're told. One question is whether it has to be that way. And then one Absolutely. question I have is what are they, what's the value or the benefit? of supposedly having people who are supposedly able to compete. I mean, how much of that benefit goes to the people and not the uh, wealthy powers that be, both locally and uh, at, you know, what I call absentee investors or multinational corporations that want to come in, have their way with our community, exploit our labor, exploit our government, exploit our environment. Talk to me. Yeah, but, and, and, and that's, the, that's the sentiment here in the world. You know, like when you talk to anybody who's really plugged into local politics and he even pointed this out as well. He was like, look, man, I've talked to people who are Republicans, people who are sort of on the right. And even they're pretty mad that basically, you know, these corporations can come in and build these real estate development deals and such. 
but they don't have to hire locally. They don't have to have local engineers. They don't have to have local construction workers. They don't have to have anything local. And he said, that's even becoming sort of a bipartisan concern. Um, and I was a little bit surprised by that. Maybe I shouldn't be, maybe I should give more credit. So to usually <laughs> bipartisan concern, usually bipartisan means we're gonna go together and screw the people. I mean, that's what bipartisan usually means. But when there's a bipartisan concern for the regular people of Louisville, talk to me. I mean, that sounds good. It's pretty alarming, you know, because <laughs> that must mean that something is really off when, when everybody can, you know what I mean? It's right. like, what are they smoking? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, he, you know, he wanted, he basically was pointing out that there are a number of uh, uh, organizations and agencies in local government or you know, nonprofits working with local government, basically, uh, to build up people's training so they don't have to incur college debt, um, so that they can do their taxes without having to pay somebody, so that they can, um, you know, build affordable housing that doesn't, you know, end up falling apart and isn't at the whim of some developer. Uh, so there's a lot of that, but he actually said, you know, there's just not a ton in the toolkit um, in the way of building the kind of power that we need. And what I mean by that is, as we got deeper into this conversation, you know, we, we talked about why is it that the knee-jerk response is always tax credits, tax incentives for, for development and, and big corporations. Why is it that that's our only carrot you know what I mean? You only get the care. Why do we stick. even need? Why do we even need a corporation that needs to be paid to locate here? What benefit is that to us, actually? I mean, what even in theory, what's supposed to be the benefit to us? And the theory is, all, of course, all theoretical. I'm not saying this is what I think, not my friend, just saying the theory. Right? You're responsible for whatever comes out of your mouth. <laughs> Somebody's going to take it out of context. Yeah, probably. Chop this up and throw it against me. Um, the theory is essentially saying there isn't enough money in Louisville. So what we got to do is attract money from outside Louisville to kick the wheels. So you bring in something like the Omni, you bring in something like the Yum Center or the soccer stadium, three developments that I actually spoke about in detail. Um, and theoretically, the idea is that attracts more people uh, to come out to Louisville, spend their money, not just at those places, but at neighboring businesses, neighboring restaurants. Uh, and, and it's sort of a package deal, right? Um, problem with that is that what we have found is that the requirements, because they do try to make requirements, you have to hire X number of people from Louisville. You got to have a median wage of $18 or $19, whatever it is, right? Um, but the problem is, is that there just isn't many, there, there aren't many mechanisms for enforcement, right? And as we got to talking, we both came to the realization that it would take uh, an actual citizens uh, powered organization with real teeth, you know, real, real ability to enforce uh, their will uh, in the form of like a veto power or the ability to bargain collectively as a community. Uh, it would take something like that in order to hold these groups accountable in a really meaningful way, you know, that the toolkit is just not currently stocked with anything to do that. Well, it would be novel if people actually controlled who does business in our community and under what circumstances. You know, local government is like state government and like federal government in that the people who call the shots are the very, very few who bring the money. Mm -hmm. And it, you're describing something that's rather novel and different. It's, it's sort of akin to, are you all familiar with the community land trust? A little bit. Somewhat, Rolf. Familiar with land not, trust. Not too much. Yeah, so the, the idea of the community land trust is essentially that, you know, a plot of land, let's say a neighborhood or, or something, or a block, right, um, is essentially owned by the community, right? And so they get to set parameters on, you know, who they're going to sell property to uh, and how much and that sort of thing. So it's you're, you're not dealing with you know, developers, you're not dealing with banks, you're dealing directly with the community. Um, and the idea behind that is to put the power of, you know, property and the land in the people's hands instead of in the hands of, as I said, developers or even city government. 
Um, and he spoke very approvingly of this and saying, uh, you know, the, the idea behind something like this is really powerful because it's, it's taking the hands outside of capital, right? And you're putting it directly into people's hand. And he said, that is so strong for breaking the chains of generational poverty, mm-hmm. so strong for breaking people's reliance on these outside interests that have no real stake in the health of their community, you know? Um, and, and all my research on affordable housing, that has been like the one consistently strong tool uh, for actually keeping housing affordable and keeping it available for people who need it uh, instead of having developers just scoop everything up and then rent it out or something like that. So you have so how low, Yeah, go ahead, Ralph. To say, how local exactly is this? Is this like a block uh, of citizens or is this like something done uh, like say a community like J-Town would decide to do that? It would be more, uh, it would be very small scale. Typically, normally, like I said, it's it's somewhere around like a city block or, or something like that. Like it's normally not, you know, town wise. It's not like the town does it. It's it's normally like the people in an actual small neighborhood. So I live on Eastern Parkway, um, you know, and and I, there's a you know a block of houses, and there's maybe seven or eight homeowners in the area, um, and it would be like us, you know, this small group of people getting a chance to to make some decisions on like you know are we going to sell out to some developer or are we going to actually make the decision to 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 make sure that we sell to the people who need it um so how obviously the land trust a tool for solving problems and and what sol- what problems are we seeking to solve with that i think with that you see a model and it's not a one-to-one comparison because of course we're talking about very complex things and we're talking about you know kind of different things with economic development especially um, but what I see is a, is a general strategic direction with the community land trust that I think if we think in terms of that strategic direction, we might be able to come up and I'm not expecting to do it on this show in an hour, uh, but you know, it, it, for future use, you know, maybe that's, that is the model going forward for giving people veto power over their neighborhood. Do you want to put a McDonald's in next door? And then people having the say, the, the actual strength to say, no, I want to invest in, I don't know, a local small business owned by my neighbor, or I want to invest in, um, you know, a community garden. I don't know. Um, people actually having the power to do that instead of uh, being sort of forced to accept whatever development is decided on by local government, I think is a, a tremendously powerful thing. It's a real leverage uh, that people can use uh, to, to build the power of, you know, working people. What do you think, Ralph? Uh, I like the concept. It's, uh, I love the concept of we in general. So anything that, that a neighborhood or even just a block can come together and do, I think that's amazing. I do think it's important that, that as a community, that we kind of put, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We kind of put uh, terms on it, on any corporation that wants to come in because a lot of times what we see across the country when they come in, they are bringing their own employees. They are gentrifying the neighborhood around them and they're basically running out the locals. So I don't see where that actually helps our community by replacing our community with a whole new community. So we need to limit that. And pretty much all I got on that. Yeah, and again, this is not to say there's like a one size fits all. It's not to say that there's, you know, one overarching theory or tactic. Um, but, you know, I was on a, co- I had a conversation this morning with with my, my local chapter of DSA about, about, you know, defunding the police and, and what that looks like in practice and all that. And the thing that we, we really got to was that there is no, you know, foolproof tactic, right? But there is a strategic direction that we can go in uh, to guide our movements because we have to understand that every situation is going to be different. But if we all kind of understand the strategy and the vol or uh, the the value that we're trying to shoot for, and I think in this case the value is putting power in the people's hands and not the, uh, the developer's hands. Uh, and that sounds very pat, that sounds very kind of 
whatever, you know, like, of course. Um, but I think it's a powerful concept and it's, it's, it's the kind of concept that if, as long as that is truly guiding our direction, um, then it'd be hard to go wrong. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, a huge problem. I mean, to me, uh, one of our most fundamental problems in the U.S. is the control of capital over everything else. When I say, you know, it's like we have the civic sphere and the governmental sphere and the business sphere. And by business, I mean big business. And big business is controlling government, and big business and government together are controlling everything else. So whenever we, and, and some people have been trained to think that, biz, that, um, that government is the threat to our freedoms, but actually, you know, government is something that we should be able to rely on to protect our freedoms and that business is the real threat. I mean, the, the big business interests want, to, want us to be blind to their role in using capital to take away our freedoms. And you're suggesting something that is, you know, where the community has a kind of a, a democratic, uh, like is this land trust controlled by the people who are in the neighborhood or is it controlled by the community of Louisville as a whole or what? So as far as like this sort of like body that I'm talking about, and again, you know, land trusts might be totally different, but I'm speaking on the concept of, of something that is, is owned by the people for the people with people's decision making being prioritized. Um, and if we're speaking in that way, I don't think that the local government would be um, really all that involved in the process. I mean, I think that mostly the thing about local government, and I've always kind of had this opinion on government generally, is that what it really needs to do is clear the way, right? It doesn't have to do it for the people because it really can't, but what it has to do is clear the way to give people a chance. Yeah. Right? And that's how I've always framed any policy that I've ever wanted, you know, anything like Medicare for all or, or, you know, something like this is like, you know, it's not asking for a handout. It's asking you for, to just get out of the way <laughs> so that the people can do what they need to do. You know what I mean? Um, and sometimes that's just getting business out of the way. Um, so that's something that I think the government role would be to basically be an advocate and to open the door or at least unlock the door so that the people in their organization can walk through. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And gosh, man, you're actually changing my mind on some stuff here as I'm talking through it. Um, I've actually long been critical of a sort of like small scale local approach to politics um, because just as my friend was talking about, that toolkit can be pretty small. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of restrictions with, at the local level. You know, local politics has a real budget, for example. They're dealing with real money, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that really restricts a lot of what you can do. But the more I'm talking about it, man, the more I am, I am actually seeing how you have to build that power from the local. And a lot of the times that starts in things like city council or the mayor's office. Again, just getting out of the way or opening the door. So we're talking about how we can, how the people can be empowered locally to have a, a local government that is more by the people and for the people. And so far we've talked about land trusts. What else can we do? I mean, well, I think, no, please Rolf, go ahead. Uh, you, you know, I'm always gonna come back to this, but something that's, that's local and for the people, by the people that we always need to consider especially when we're trying to be proactive and grow the city going forward is municipal broadband. Of course, I've talked about this a lot, but it, it's eventually most of the cities are going to have it. We need to have it. We need to do it now. We need, need to make sure we don't fall behind, <clears throat> but it's going to keep the young local professionals here by having that. It's also going to attract other young, young professionals to the city for jobs when we have that. So that's going to be a key. If we want to grow things locally, then we got to have municipal broadband involved, in my opinion. How does that help, Rolf? Because that, uh, for one, it gives us control. So having municipal broadband makes us as a community the owners of broadband. So we're always going to have net neutrality built in. And part of that, as we've talked about before, is the financial aspect of the fast lane and the slow lane. If we have net neutrality built in, there are no fast lanes and slow lanes. So that's going to, 
able the, the mom and pop local stores to compete on a digital level with the corporations. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I see it as a utility, that just like water or electricity. Like, you know, when we think of what, what sort of utilities are needed, um, you know, I, I think that in this age, you can't, you can't afford to not think of the internet as that way. You know, and it's funny, a lot of my like conservative family members are like, oh, all these people buying laptops, why aren't they like spending their money investing or something? And it's like, well, I don't know, man, try competing in the job market without a computer or a good internet connection, you know, or a smartphone even like you really can't. Um, and unfortunately, we are locked into this sort of competition with other cities and workforces. Um, but the thing to do is that you got to keep people uh, uh, at parity. You know what I mean? You can't afford to fall behind you're saying Rolf. Exactly. So what both of y'all are saying, or especially what Rolf was saying with the local broadband, making it, uh, uh, ha making it easier for local businesses to compete with out of town businesses. I'm an advocate of what I call local sovereignty or at least local control. We should have veto power over what businesses want to locate here. And, uh, you know, especially new businesses. If McDonald's has, I don't know, 10, 15 stores, we should say, okay, you've gone far enough. Uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to start making an evaluation as a community. Do you have an ethical and sustainable supply chain? And do you have ethical and sustainable business operations? And if not, we're going to say no to any new businesses, uh, in this community, uh, and, and that would level the playing field for local businesses. If we, if it was a truly democratic process, uh, and the, the problem with, with a couple problems with giving everything over to out of town Wall Street companies, one is it makes our community look like every other community. So it's like, hey, I'm gonna go to Louisville. Why? Because they have a Starbucks. And guess what else? They have a Home Depot. That's why I want to go to Louisville. No, you go to Louisville because they have unique local businesses. I mean, starting with uh, local uh, farm, any local farm can be a tourist destination. Uh, and local farms that provide local food for local businesses can be unique. And it gives you a story to tell. Oh, I went to Indianapolis. They had a Rafferty's. That's why I went to Indianapolis. <laughs> I couldn't wait to eat at the Rafferty's that they had. No, they, so. Hey, man, those cheese fries are fire, though. Oh, I, I, know. Know. I know. We can't, we can't extend, we can't totally tear down the Rafferty's, but I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying tear them down. I'm saying uh, we're going to ha start having a little conversation yes. about whether your supply chain is ethical and sustainable. And, uh, you know, some people might say, oh, business is the engine of growth. What? We're not capable of making that determination. Business is the engine of growth, and business is the one that gets to decide that business is the one that gets to decide which businesses are the engine of growth and under what circumstances and business is the ones that get to decide who gets a living wage and who doesn't. So anyway, Man, just sound like a, go ahead. You're preaching right now. Over here, like <laughs> snapping my fingers. Like it's a slam poetry. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that's, that's so good. And that's, that's, that's precisely what I was talking to my buddy about is this idea of like, how do you build an institution for the citizens to have a veto power, right? How do you build an institution and how do you build engagement? I mean, like, let's be honest, you know, like how many times have, have people try to canvas to do like participatory budgeting or something and people are just like, eh, I'm good, you know, yeah. that's too much. And I get that, but like, you know, you're not gonna build the engagement, you know, now that I'm, I'm arguing with myself, um, but you're not gonna build that engagement without having vibrant institutions that have been in place and that actually have power that people actually feel like, oh, if I invest in this, it'll actually lead to something. Yeah, I like saying that, you know, I mean, to take climate change, the conversation, it's like show, if we had democracy, we wouldn't, we'd have a whole different conversation around climate change and any other environmental issue. Take Medicare for all, take a living wage. If we had true democracy, we would be having a whole different conversation because there are these organizations that are totally dedicated to how to talk to people about climate change. Well, if people had any damn say so in what goes on if people were empowered to do anything but it, uh, then 
then you wouldn't have to make, have a scientific study of how to talk to your neighbor about climate change. Because if your neighbor had, a, had any, you know, any power in that fight, it could have any fun making changes, then it would be a whole different conversation. That's why I say that all these, you know, every, the conversations around every major issue would be in a different conversation if we had actual democracy. Right, and that, uh, that to me just kind of demonstrates why we need to move toward politics at a local level as a whole. Uh, I know we like to focus on the presidential race and this and that, but I don't see much of a path forward in this country through federal elections. Mm. I think, you know, the, the elections themselves aren't, I don't trust them, for one. So, you know, I, I don't have that. I don't see that as much of a problem at the local elections. You know, I think those are more legitimate. And without the big money in the local elections, I think we can kind of rally around the right people and the issues that we need as a community. Whereas at the federal level, it's just not going to happen. We have a two party system. They both basically agree on most things. What they don't agree on, it, it's very slight and mostly rhetoric. But at the local level, there are legitimate people running because they legitimately care about things and we can talk we can actually go and meet with these people and talk to them i know i have you're not talking about greg fisher but go ahead no no <laughs> i haven't talked to him i tried and uh we're not you know, talking about a legitimate me. person there yeah he, he sent me to a, a couple of people in his staff who who were pretty decent people but pretty uh pretty handcuffed in their ability to do what uh, they needed to do so <laughs> i'll right. leave it at that um but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely about local. For, for me, I always focused on national and international up until a couple of years ago when when I just if I felt like I was banging my head against the wall and nothing was ever going to change. So so that's where I made the move to to try to learn more locally and statewide and try to go that route. And I think that's where we need to go. We can still vote in these national elections and we can still push the policies like Medicare for all, Green New Deal, and so on. But but what we really need to do is focus locally and just bubble up and keep bubbling up and, and just rise up from the bottom. So That's why do you want to get that change? Ralph, why do you want to focus on the local? Because I think we can actually make a difference there. You know, there's no guarantee that we can, but there is a chance. Whereas I feel like there's no chance at the federal level, just none. We have no influence at all. The statistics show that, you know, we're not the big money donors, so we're not going to make any change there. But here locally, I can call up my councilman and I can go meet with him. You know, I can, I can and I have talked to my state senator. I can and I have talked to my state rep. You know, I worked on bills with them and that's not something I could ever get done, you know, through my U.S. senator or through the president. It's just not going to happen. You mean hey, I, Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul are not calling you up asking for your opinion? No, I can't even get Rand Paul to respond to my emails without, uh, just saying, hey, I got your email, cool. And, uh, you know, and I get, you know, so many of those, it's the exact same email, uh, regardless of what topic I, I wrote him about, you know, I can't get through to him. Uh, I can't get him on the phone. I can't get McConnell on the phone. It's never happened. At most, I get, you know, maybe an email response from McConnell like three months after the fact or whatever. So, you know, uh, there's just nothing happening there. And I think he just does that, you know, he picks a day a month where they just send out these, pre-typed out letters and and uh act like they're paying attention or whatever but he doesn't give a damn i don't know that he's agreed with me on literally anything i've talked to him about in the last 20 years you know but uh but i've had much better luck locally they listen to me they they literally listen to me and you know there's been change happening and and while not everybody is lucky as me to have you know as good a representative as i have uh you know that's still the way to go and we can come together and we 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 can all, even if I can't personally pressure my local representative to make change, there's enough of us in the community. If we do that, they're going to listen because there's the big money. It's just not there holding them back. So, uh, Okay, Rolf, you have a Monsanto shirt on. I want to get you to tell me about that in just a minute. But one of the main things. Anti-Monsanto. Uh, yeah. Anti I, 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 well, oh, I thought you were. I just want to clarify that for those who can't see it. Yeah. I thought Monsanto was your favorite thing. Oh, no, 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 no. I've been to a Neil Young concert too, so I can relate. <laughs> so how's Neil Young related to Monsanto? Oh man, he, dude, oh my God, you haven't seen it. He wrote like whole concept albums 
about Monsanto, like fantasies about like fist fighting Monsanto, basically. That dude is about it. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love Neil Young as young as I am, but yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things that seems like we could change is our local, um, you know, food scene. And honestly, I, I almost get stumped right there because it's like, how do we go about it? But, you know, we have to get the uh, attention and the support of, of our Metro Council and our, our, uh, our mayor. And the first step in that is to just acknowledge that they're all clowns and charlatans. And, you know, there might be a third of the Metro Council members that are serious problem solvers, but even they are strapped by a system that just favors money and they have to sit in meetings where uh, the purpose is to grease the skid for out of, sta out of town interests. But, uh, it, you know, if, how do they spend their time and why aren't they spending their time uh, helping people get access to healthy local food and why aren't they spending their time helping local uh, businesses by somehow leveling the playing field uh, with the uh, you know absentee investors the out-of-town multinational corporations but I'm struggling here I'm, I'm confident that they could do something but but they would have to make it a priority yeah they would have to make it a priority and also like the, the thing that I gotta I gotta return to is this idea of local government and really government generally uh, as sort of a conduit right like it's not the energy is not coming from the government it's coming from these different power sources right these different directions and and I think that the issue in this country um, obviously is that the power is all sort of centralized in the hands of capital and it's not at all in the hands of working people. Um, and so the government, I'm not trying to translation, like- Translation, we don't have a democracy. We have a fake democracy. Politics is not politics, it's political theater. It's WWE. It's like pretending to be adversaries. It's all this theater that yes. goes in, in our democracy. Uh, and, but it, it's not a democracy if, the, if you have very little choice uh, if the you know the the Republican and the Democrat are virtually the same in every material respect, they're bought by the same people. But they're bought by the same banks. They're bought by the war machine. They're bought by the developers. They're bought by big ag. Who am I missing here? They're bought by health insurance. Yeah, and and so like you're exactly right in that like they they can't really have an adversarial relationship uh, to those organizations without a countervailing power, right? Um, and it's sort of a dual role because they also stop people from building that countervailing power. Um, those, you know, especially like, you know, the DNC and all that stuff, they, they're sort of like protecting their position. Um, but I think that what I'm getting to here is that it's going to take these kind of worker organizations like we're talking about. It's going to take like strong labor unions and it's going to take, you know, organized people. Like I said, having some, some sort of veto power, right? Like it's going to take that to exert enormous pressure on the government to actually make these things happen, you know? Um, and I'm not saying it doesn't matter who's in office. It obviously does a great deal. Um, but I think that that's the focus. That's the, the, the real place where energy can be sort of developed and deployed um, is, is at that level, is at that level of just normal citizens building up some sort of organization like that. Yeah, you say it, it matters a great deal who's in office, but look at, uh, you know, Kentucky has seven, no, six U.S. representatives in the U.S. House of Representatives. John Yarmouth is the only uh, Democrat out of the six representatives that Kentucky has. He votes for the National Defense Authorization Act. He votes against, uh, he, he votes for this anti-BDS uh, resolution, which is by voting for that, he lined up on the side of free speech. I, on the, I mean, he, he lined up against free speech. He lined up for this uh, radical pro-Israel lobby that Israel can do no wrong, even when they're decimating Palestinian community, et cetera. So that's who we have. That's, a, that's the Democrat that we have. He can't be relied on to speak. He, he was against Medicare for all until our friends in the DSA 
uh, had a had a podcast with him and embarrassed him into at least endorsing Bernie Sanders' bill. He uh, bugged the crap out of that guy. <laughs> yeah, and it's like he's still not for Medicare for all because no doubt Humana puts a lot of money into it, just guessing. But anyway, that's the Democrat. That's the Democrat. Yeah, and I, I guess what that goes to show is like. You know, it matters to some degree, I think, I, to defend my statement, excuse me, uh, was simply that there are some people who are never going to be even open to opening the door. You know what I mean? Like, there are some people in office, like, I, I, you know, hot take here. I'd probably vote for, like, Amy McGrath over Mitch McConnell. I would, because that dude is never even going to be swayed. You can't leverage a thing oh, on yeah. that guy. Right, but, right. but some people might, you might be able to at least... Um, for lack of a better word, bully them into the right position. I think politicians are the only people we should be allowed to bully. Um, but, you know, you have to have a force to bully them. I don't mind voting for an Amy McGrath or a Joe Biden. I just don't want to be browbeaten. It's like into it as if it's the only rational choice, as if you're wasting your vote if you vote for a third party or if you don't vote at all. Anyway. Yeah. Rolf, did you have something? I saw you start to speak up, but I am like rolling through everybody go, right go now. for it Sorry. man go for it yeah <laughs> well all of this talk you know i wanted to bring this up um was you know have you all heard of the concept of regionalism as a governing body or governing strategy i've heard of bioregionalism where you you know try to like a you know, food shed is like an area an area like the greater louisville area would be where we get most of our food that kind of thing so um, I, when I was at U of L and I was in my master's program, uh, I had a professor, a uh, really great guy uh, named by David Ambrosio. Um, and he, uh, he really opened my mind to this idea. And we didn't always agree on everything about it, but it sounded like such a radical idea that really is touching on all of what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, and he's a big scholar on regionalism, uh, Gar, Alper Al Gar Alperovitz, it's quite a mouthful. Uh, is another leading scholar on this topic. Uh, and what they really advocate for is having um, not quite autonomy, um, but near autonomy or sovereignty like Hart was talking about for certain regions, right? And that could be as large as say, you know, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, you know, um, or even as small as, you know, Louisville stretching around to a, a little more than what the metro area is now. Um, but essentially just giving a lot of the economic development just being focused on within that area, businesses from within that area, um, you know, not spreading people around, but instead building communities up. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and, and really giving people in those communities real control, real with muscle kind of control uh, over what is developed there. And sometimes that looks like co-ops. Um, you know, sometimes that looks like just building up small businesses in the area. Um, but point being, it, it really is, there is a field of research on this topic that we're on. As opposed to like, you have the KIPTA as Kentucky, Indiana, something, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's like they decide how, how to develop the transportation system in our region. And it's like, they're they're so it, if you want transportation funds you have to spend it on highways but they they make relatively small decisions and the federal government makes the big decisions about anyway that's probably a different topic but so how would regionalism work how could it be uh, implemented what are some of the legal changes that would have to be made how would it look different from what we have now my gosh, I mean, that's a direct threat to, to federalism, isn't it? I mean, really, it is a huge threat to the way that we do, uh, with the way that we structure government. Um, and I personally think that's a desirable change. Uh, I think that too often uh, we really do get caught up, and I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, all this red tape, we just need to cut through the red tape. It's not that simple. Sometimes red tape is actually quite good. Right, right. Um, but there is a real thing where, where people at a local level um, are really at the whim of somebody in Washington or even Frankfurt. And, and you're just stuck 
uh, because you're waiting on funds from somewhere else, you're waiting on the okay from somewhere else, somewhere that's not invested uh, in, the, in the local community. Um, I'm sure, Rolf, you probably got stories. I know that you're, you kind of get involved in the, a lot of this stuff, and I'm sure that you have tried to make a change at a local level, and then you get caught up and say, well, we can't do that because that's a state concern, that's a federal concern. Like, do you, have, do you have anything that pops in mind for that? But this is the kind of thing I want to avoid. Well, that's uh, my adventures with net neutrality and municipal broadband have kind of led me down that path. So, you know, when I'm uh, talking to the state level people, they kind of push that toward the city people and the city people kind of push that to the state people. And I'm like, look, I don't, you know, I'm trying to do both, to be honest. I want net neutrality at the state level. I want municipal broadband at the city level. And I, I, I can say I am making some ground on it now with the net neutrality at the state level, but municipal broadband has been thoroughly blocked. Uh, I'm not done working on that. Uh, not defeated yet, but it, it's, uh, it's a long road, road to hoe on that. So, um, but Morgan McGarvey is actually writing a net neutrality bill at the state level. I had a meeting with him about that, and, and it's going to be introduced in January. So we've got that coming and then it's just going to be on us to push that through and, you know, full court pressure basically to make sure we can try to get that passed. But it is, it, you know, I didn't know where to start. So I just started contacting my lawmakers who, who will actually talk to me and meet with me. And so I met with all of them and it's just, it's just that basically the city level push, pushes off on the state, blames the budget issues. We don't have the money. We totally agree with you on municipal broadband, but there's just no way it's ever going to be affordable. And, uh, you know, you know my always goes great when they say we totally agree with you. Yeah, but uh, that's always a great start. <laughs> Right. And then I asked for suggestions. Well, couldn't sympathize more. Right. And so, I, so I said to them, you know, uh, this was a couple of, uh, the them I'm talking about. I don't remember their names at this point, but they, they work for Fisher. Uh, I said to them, so, you know, what, what strategies can we do? Let's think out of the box. How do we make this happen? And then basically the response is just, and so, you know, they, they don't have the answers. They're not really looking for the answers. They're not fighting for the answers. There are people that if everybody else in charge was for this and pushing it, they would put their name behind it and say, yeah, I support that. But they're not going to make it happen. And, and they're good people uh, as far as I could tell from the meetings, but it, it's just not there. They're not fighters for us. So, you know, we just keep putting pressure on. I, I do feel like, you know, even just talking with them, if they were on a different staff, there might be something there, but it, you know, they have to look at who their boss is. Their boss is Fisher. Fisher clearly doesn't want this to happen. Uh, I haven't spoken with him personally, but, uh, just, you know, w with his staff that's in charge of these things, you can tell he doesn't, he's not a fan. He's not going to make this happen, but we can vote him out and we can get the next staff in there and, and we can keep pushing, you know? So, uh, I see it as one of our most important fights, because it's, it's going to affect, you know, how we develop as a city. And it literally helps everybody across the board, regardless of demographics. So I'm just going to keep up with it. Even if we get the net neutrality through at the state level, I'm going to keep up with the municipal broadband. It's, it's an important fight. Yeah. So you've got net neutrality at the state level and municipal broadband. So municipal broadband would bring about uh, net neutrality at the local level? Yes. So it basically the municipal broadband means we own our own infrastructure and we build net neutrality right into that so that no matter what happens going forward, we always have net neutrality here with our infrastructure. As opposed to having fast lanes and slow lanes and it depend whether you have a fast lane or a slow lane for your website depends on uh, whether or not you've bought an, a, an, a plan, a better plan, and it's easier for the out-of-town companies to buy that more expensive plan because multinational corporate, the bigger the corporation, the more skilled they are at, at extracting favors from government, the more skilled they are at shifting costs onto us. And that includes, uh, am I on the right track about that? Absolutely. Cause you know, a large corporation, it, if we do completely lose net neutrality and we have fast lanes and slow lanes, it's not going to affect the corporations in a bad way because they have the money. So no matter what, they can afford to pay extra to be in that fast lane. But the money on that, it's at both ends. So not only is it 
paying to be which lane you're on. So a corporation obviously paying for a fast lane. Can a small business afford every month to pay to stay in the fast lane? Or are they going to get stuck in the slow lane? And then if they do get stuck in the slow lane, are they going to be able to compete online with anybody in the fast lane? Probably not. But also on the other end of that, as far as cost, it affects the consumer. So I could get the internet with just the fast lane, and then I'm stuck just looking at corporate sites. Or I have to pay more to also be able to access all the companies in the slow lane at the same speed. So that's more money on the consumer just to even be able to look at what I want to look at or research, you know, other things that I want to research. So it's a double edged sword there. They get you both ways, but with net neutrality, we just even all of that out. It's the same speed for everybody. It's the same access to everybody. And if it's municipal broadband, we own it. They can never take that away from us. Yeah. And that's, that's a really powerful point. I mean, and it ties into this economic development stuff. It ties into really everything. I mean, like I said, it's a utility that right now you kind of just need to survive really. Um, and you know, something else I was thinking about now that we're discussing sort of like regional control or local control, um, you know, we were like, a, we've been talking a lot about police lately <laughs> and by we, I mean, not just, you know, us, but I think everyone, <laughs> um, and something that came up in my, <laughs> right. It's everywhere. Um, you know, but the, the thing that I, that I talked about this morning with the police, something that came up was, uh, the idea of the 1033 program where, you know, the military will send their surplus equipment out to police stations uh, across the country. And something we talked about was like, gosh, even if we defund the police, right, there's all this call for defunding. Oh, yeah. Even if we do that, there will still be this influx of military grade weaponry coming into these local police departments. My favorite is like an MRAP. Is that like a, a mini tank or something like that? Yeah, I and, think so. Yeah. And it's like, let's have tanks and let's have uh, rocket propelled grenades, you know? <laughs> well, yeah. Like, I mean, I, I've seen people protecting in like Eastern. Serving. What's that, yeah. Ralph? I said protecting and serving. Yeah, protect oh, yes. and serve. You know, I've seen people in Eastern Kentucky talking about, you know, we have a town of like 2000 people and our cops are lobbying to get a tank. <laughs> like, oh my God. You know what I mean? Like stuff like that. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, when we're talking about local control, I think we'd be really missing an important component of this if we're not talking about policing. And if we're not talking about the kind of stuff that ends up in our police departments, um, because we see that, you know, the, the people don't really have control over the police anyway. Um, because they answer to, you know, the government, which answers to capital, de facto, transitive property, police answer to capital. Um, but Jake, this is an analysis. You can't subject Americans to analysis. They're not used to it. Their heads will explode. Right, right. That's the, the prevailing theory. Um, gosh, it's really insulting, isn't it? The way that we, we treat... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's another thing that you were talking about is like, what, Americans can't cook? Like, we can't, yeah, right. we can't decide anything in our community? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think that we'd be missing, missing the plot if we didn't talk about, you know, the fact that, you know, we already don't have very much control over police anyway. Uh, we don't even have control over what guns they're shooting us with. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and, and if we're talking about that, I think that's one, one piece of the puzzle when we're talking about bringing control to the people and on a local level, uh, that program needs to be a major target, I think, you know, cause we're talking about, you know, have you seen those like sonic mines where they LRADs, is that what they're called? Um, they, they put them up in like New York and I think San Francisco during these protests. And uh, basically if you stand, uh, you know, parallel to the, those things, they will completely deafen you. You know, mm. just like sonic, like I said, they're mines, based, sonic mines, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and why on earth? Orwell could only dream of what we have now. Right, right. And I mean, I'm of the opinion that I don't think that I don't want to see that, that stuff, you know, anywhere. I don't want to see them doing that in Iraq, you know, and, but I also don't want them to see them doing it here, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, I think that that's an important piece of this too, is that we got to recognize 
the brief brief aside i've been reading yeah. about darpa and the latest things that they have they they're developing insect sized drones uh which, which can you know not only surveil but also can carry a payload of miniature explosives and assassinate people it's like you know not all technology is good you know right right you know um, and, and I think that we, we don't even have control over the technology flowing in and out of our cities, you know? So, so you guys might've brought me into this conversation to be another, another talking head on the program. Uh, but you might've convinced me of, of the utility of, of sort of local fights. I mean, I always saw local politics as being very much handcuffed. Uh, to a, a strict budget and a strict set of political realities and a strict set of resources. I mean, I'm not saying that I want to have like locals that are cut off from each other. You can't have that, you know, because there is only so much, so many resources you can have in one place. Um, but at the same time, you know, local, local control, local decision making is so important. And, and, and my big project in life is I want people to be less alienated from one another and less alienated from the resources around them. And I think maybe this is a, a way to do it. I'm wanting to uh, grab our, uh, our Metro Council members by the lapel and say, uh, our, damn it, I want you to speak for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yes, we have a federal system. Yes, the state is uh, strictly over you in that hierarchy. Yes, the federal government is strictly over you in that hierarchy. But, but damn it, if it, 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 you speak for us. Pass non-binding resolutions speaking for the people. Uh, so, you know, part of that is there's this whole effort to get Louisville to adopt a renewable energy you know, 100% renewable energy. And that, that's, that's fine as far as it goes. But, you know, the Metro Council has the attention span of a gnat. And it doesn't matter that you uh, passed a 100% renewable energy resolution uh, six months ago. They're, they're, off to, they're off to the newest shiny object, which now is, uh, you know, policing, et cetera. And that needs to be attended to. But we don't have meaningful representation. And, and there are so many snags. I mean, renewable energy is itself problematic because as you have, you know, solar and wind, you have, you have all of these rare earth metals that have to go into making these things. You have slave labor that's mining the parts that are needed for wind and solar energy and for a state-of-the-art electric grid. You have these, these problems that are baked in. Anything, we're, we're on course now for doing way too little, way too late. And it's because they get by with tokenism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's all the way up and down the ladder, unfortunately. Um, but sometimes, you know, like Rolf was saying, like you've been saying, sometimes the the place where you can get that 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 lever in, you know, what I mean, to actually move something, sometimes you got to start small, and it's like the dominoes, man, it just goes right up the ladder. That's the hope, you know. What are the but, dominoes going to do? Oh, well, hopefully they'll, hopefully, you know, if you, if you exert enough pressure at the local level, they can exert enough pressure with, you know, your city level on up to the state on up to, you know what I'm saying? Like it, mm -hmm. hopefully that's, that's what we can do. And hopefully building up your local organizations, your local uh, movements, uh, like here in Louisville, working with people involved in the Black Lives Matter stuff, whether it's DSA, unions, whatever, if you're building something that's going to exert people power. I mean, hopefully that'll, that'll get the leverage, you know, I don't think any theory of change is ever going to be accepted until it's worked. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't want to sit here and pound my chest over one or the other. Um, but gosh, it's worth a try, right? <laughs> All it takes is just one community or one state to enact something. And then you'll see it matriculate to other places, such as, you know, uh, California with, with marijuana. And then that, you know, that became legal for medical and then it's spreading out across the entire country. We're seeing medical in most states now and legal in several states, and that's going to continue to go that way. Uh, we can also look at Chattanooga, Tennessee with Gig City. They were the first one to do municipal broadband. And now we have, you know, all these cities across, across the country that are doing municipal broadband and several more that are putting this in place. So it just takes one city to, to enact something and get it right, and people will pay attention. 
So that's something that we need to do here too. If we see another city do something and get it right, we need to pay attention to that and follow suit if we can. Like what? Just, you know, whatever, like, like Gig City, you know, their success with municipal broadband, we need to pay attention to that. That's Chattanooga being that successful with it. If they can do it, certainly we can. Uh, same, same with the, the legal marijuana. If these other states can do it, we can do that here. We can get that tax revenue too and put that to use for the people. So, I mean, there's so many examples. We could do a whole nother show on that, but, but that's just two right off the top of my head. And so anything that we can fix from community policing to, you know, ending the food deserts in parts of the city or, or whatever topic, if we can fix that and get it right, other communities will pay attention. They will do the same thing. And next thing you know, that's going to be spread across the country. And so that's what I'm talking about with bubbling up. It, it's just the spread of, spread of, you know, the policy. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at, uh, uh, there's an organization called New Roots, which is kind of a, it's a CSA for people who live in poverty, people, low income people. CSA means community supported agriculture. So it's a way of getting fresh local uh, produce from uh, local farms and distributing it to people who otherwise uh, live in food deserts. And uh, why are we spending money on the Omni instead of spending money on at least the infrastructure and maybe some of the marketing expenses for a really good idea that could help a whole lot of people if it had any support whatsoever. But instead we're getting, you know, Kentucky as fertile as we are, as fertile as this region is, we still get like 99% of our food from non-locally. It's pretty alarming when you put it that Thank way. <laughs> um, pandemic times, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's the other thing that we have to think about. I mean, I'm call me like a doomer or whatever, but like there is part of me. I'm 26, you know, and like everybody talks about like the the climate change sort of like becoming a reality for people that are much younger than we expected. And I do worry about that. I worry like if we don't build up something local for our food supply line, for any sort of economic development, um then I really am very concerned about my own future. <laughs> Um, and I hope that's what Louisville can lead on, something like food or something like economic development. Those are the two things that I think maybe Louisville could lead on, and it's going to take a lot more brainstorming sessions to come up with that, but I'd like to see it. That's why we're here. We're brainstorming. We're going to be that virtual parallel government the, that is the real voice in things. <laughs> that's our dual power. You're laughing at me like I'm the most ridiculous person that ever walked. No. But I've, I've been, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> we have about a minute left. Can y'all leave us with any words of wisdom? Like what, what can we do with our local government or why in the world is there any hope whatsoever? <laughs> Rolf, go ahead. Uh, I don't think I can get any words of wisdom in in a minute, but I'll just say to anybody watching this on YouTube, leave your ideas in the comments and let us know what you think we can do in this city. What can we get accomplished? What, what should we focus on primarily and, and give us some feedback. And I would just say, you know, organize, find some people organizing, find somebody building some sort of institution, lean into it. You're not always going to agree, but I guarantee you it's much worse if you're not involved. Take a minute and tell us how to get in contact with y'all, Rolf and Jake. Uh, with me, uh, I have the Louisville Proactivist Report. Proactivist is one word. I'm on Facebook. That's my main page, YouTube, as well as Twitter. So you can find me there. Uh, you can also just hit me up on Facebook at Rolf Fries. And uh, yeah, like, share, subscribe. And then for me, uh, I mean, I'm available through DSA. So you can find us at uh, Louisville DSA. We're all over Facebook, Twitter. You just search for that. You're going to find us. I believe dsalouisville.org uh, is our website. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at, at drag the underscore lake, um, and I'm mostly goofing off, but you can talk to me on there at least. Great. Thanks, guys, uh, and thanks to our listeners. Come back soon. <laughs>